Thank you for joining me for worship today. Today is the second Sunday of End Times, Last Judgment Sunday. Our order of service is in our bulletins, and we're going to begin right now with hymn number 441, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of your throne, your saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is your arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received its frame. From everlasting you are God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in your sight are like an evening gone. Short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time like an ever-rolling stream soon bears us all away. We fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Still be our guard while troubles last and our eternal worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful. I have disobeyed you and justly deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for the evil I have thought, spoken, and done. And for the sake of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. I now ask you before God who searches the heart, do you confess your sins of thought, word, and deed? Are you sorry for your sins? Do you look to our Savior, Jesus Christ, for forgiveness? And with the Holy Spirit's help, do you want to correct your sinful life? Then declare so by saying, yes. Upon this confession, I, as a called servant of the word, announce to you God's grace and the forgiveness of sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this second Sunday of end time, Last Judgment Sunday, is from Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 1 to 6. Here the Lord is reminding us that his justice is not something to be trifled with that a judgment day is coming. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. 
Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from his evil way. Then I will relent and not bring on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of, the, of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city an object of cursing among the nations of the earth. Alleluia. Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Our epistle reading is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. This reading does remind us, oh, that those who reject God's grace will be separated from his blessings forever. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of, of God, for which you are suffering. God is just, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn number 474, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are brave now serve him, against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, 
Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. The grace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with us always. Amen. The word of God we want to consider today is our gospel reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 11 to 27. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who are our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow servants of our Savior, Jesus Christ, there is an old French fable that talks about this small village that just had received a new clergyman. And the village decided that what each person in the village was supposed to do is bring some wine and put it in a large barrel, and that large barrel would be presented to the new clergyman as a welcome gift. Well, the village blacksmith, he was a wise and frugal man, and he decided that what he could do is he could depend on everybody else in the village to bring wine, and what he would do is he would just simply bring water to put in that large barrel. Well, when it came time for him to put his wine into the barrel, he came there and he poured his 
water into the barrel. And after everyone was all done putting their wine into the battle barrel, what happened is that, well, the barrel was presented to the new clergyman, the spigot was turned on the barrel, and out came pure water. And this is an old story, but an old story that teaches a lesson. Sometimes what happens in this life is that what people do is they depend on others to do the work and kind of shrug off their own responsibilities. That wise and frugal blacksmith wasn't the only wise and frugal one in that village. They all were wise and frugal, but they ended up coming off looking very, very foolish because of their being wise and foolish. Well, Jesus' parable of the ten minas, it teaches us something similar to that parable. And, well, the, the lesson of the parable is that each one of us really wants to be concerned about our own faithfulness to God. We want to be concerned about our own faithfulness and we won't want to be thinking, well, we'll just let the others take care of things. We want to be concerned about our own faithfulness. Well, in this parable, there was a nobleman who entrusted one mina, that's about three months' wages, to each of ten servants who were going to be held accountable for their use of the minas. And how they used their mina, whether they used it faithfully or unfaithfully, that was really symbolic of how we serve the Lord in this life. The faithful, unfaithful use of their minas represents our opportunities to be faithful to our Lord in this life our efforts to serve the Lord and to grow in his grace and love and reach out to the world with the message of his grace and love, with his soul-saving gospel. So as we consider our opportunities to be faithful, we shall see what God invests in us, what blessings we can experience, and what God expects of us. At the time of our reading, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem, their final trip to Jerusalem before his suffering and death. And now because the time for Jesus to teach his disciples was coming to an end, was running short now, what Jesus did is he talked to them extensively about the kingdom of God. And of course, as he was talking about the kingdom of God, he was talking about the spiritual, the eternal kingdom to which all believers belong. But the tragic thing is, is that when he talked about the kingdom of God, many of his followers thought that Jesus' whole purpose in going to Jerusalem now was to become an earthly king, to set up an earthly kingdom. And, well, when you think about the miracles that Jesus performed, healing the sick, casting out demons, making a very small amount of food on two different occasions serve to feed thousands of people, Controlling the weather. The miracles that he performed, they would have made Jesus a great earthly king in the mind of the people. But to correct such false ideas, thinking that Jesus was just an earthly king, Jesus used his faith, favorite method of, of instruction, the, the, the parable. And he used common, everyday pictures, stories that people could relate to so that he could teach them a spiritual lesson, so that he could teach them really about the kingdom of God. 
And now in the parable, the parable of the ten minas, there was a nobleman who was preparing to go to a far country, it says, to receive a kingdom. And that was a fairly common occurrence in Jesus' day because what the Roman Empire would often do if someone was going to become a governor or a king of an area, he'd go to Rome and get his assignment from Rome and then come back to actually govern over the people under his care. But in this instance, before he left, what this nobleman did is he called in 10 of his servants and gave each of them a mina, three months worth of salary, not a small amount, and said to them just simply, put this money to work until I come back. In the parable, Jesus would be the nobleman and his going off to receive a kingdom would refer to his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And of course, like that nobleman returning, well, Jesus returns on judgment day. The 10 servants here, that includes us and, and all believers and well, those who would profess to be believers, maybe we'd have to say in, in some response here, the mina, it symbolizes what God invests in each of us as believing children of God, and that's the gospel. The power of God for salvation. The power of God, what God uses to call people to faith, to make people believers, to build us up and strengthen us in our faith. That's the minor. And now what a privilege it is that God has given to sinners like you and me that wonderful gospel message. And I've often said that his giving us the gospel is kind of like Eaton Community Bank deciding that it's going to give a million dollars to a bum who has no clue how to use any money at all. That kind of doesn't make sense. And in a sense, you'd have to say that God giving us his gospel, that doesn't make sense either. He gives his gospel message to us sinners who have no spiritual credit rating on our own. And he gives us his precious word to use. And well, what a privilege and what a responsibility that is that God has given us his word. It's a very serious responsibility, of course, because it's only through the working of God's word that the Holy Spirit calls people to faith in Jesus the Savior and away from the eternal punishment that, that we would rightfully deserve. Fortunately, when we think about God giving us that wonderful privilege of having the gospel like that, what Jesus also promises us is that he's always going to be with us. He's always going to help us to make the most of our opportunities to be faithful to our Lord so we can use faithfully use the gospel that he has entrusted to us and, and our care. In the parable this nobleman who went off to receive a kingdom, he had his enemies who didn't want him to be king, but he was made king and did return home. Likewise, our Savior also has his enemies, and when we talk about his enemies, well, it's not just talking about those enemies, those Jewish leaders who had him crucified. At times, we're his enemies too because of the sin that's in our lives. Anybody who's trusting in his own works to try to get to heaven ends up ultimately being an enemy of God. But now in the parable, it says that the nobleman had his enemies, but he returned back and he was made king. And well, Jesus had his enemies and his enemies... They couldn't defeat him. They can't defeat our Savior. Right now, Jesus is ruling in our hearts and in the hearts of all who, by the grace of God, believe in him. 
and he's going to return on Judgment Day. And when he comes back on Judgment Day, he's going to take you and me to that eternal kingdom that, that he's prepared for us in heaven. But when he returns, he says also here that he's going to check to see what we've done with the gospel, with what he's invested in us. In the parable, Jesus tells us what happened with three of the servants, three of the ten servants to whom he entrusted a mina, and two of them acted wisely, and one he did nothing with the mina that was entrusted to him. He just took it and hid it in a piece of cloth, it says. The comment of the two financially astute serv servants is really very significant here. They didn't say, I have gained this amount of profit for you. But rather what they said was this, your mina has earned and more. Your mina has earned five more. They did merely what they were commanded to do by the noblemen. And they discovered that the mina, the money that they had been given, it had the power to accomplish things, to be a blessing for them. And that's how how it is in God's kingdom. We've been given the word of God to proclaim and the sacraments to administer and of those means through which God gives us his grace and blessings, well, God says, my word will not return to me empty but will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word works. It reaches people. It reaches hearts and souls with the gospel message. And what God just simply wants us to do is invest his gospel, well, in ourselves, of course, and then also in the people we meet with confidence that that gospel has the power to produce blessings. And always remember, you and I don't convert people. We can't persuade anybody to be a Christian, but God's word will keep on building us up in our faith and it will keep on gaining more and more souls for God's eternal kingdom. Well, what kind of opportunities to be faithful can we take advantage of? Well, we do have our Lord's great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And when we preach God's word, when we share God's word with others, what we're doing is we're investing the gospel which God has entrusted to us, which he's invested in us so that we ourselves can grow in the faith and, and what blessings we can experience as our faith grows. Our faith, what it's going to do is help us to cope with the trials and troubles that we face as a part of, as a part of living in this sinful world. Oh, I, I often think of this lady, Mrs. Helgeson, from the church I served in Mobile. She was dying of cancer, and it was really tough for her, and and her response to those tough circumstances was to say this, I don't know how a person can get through something like this without faith. And the fact of the matter is, is our faith is not going to make life's trials and troubles go away. Our faith is not going to make life's trials and troubles go away. If anybody tells you if you have enough faith that they'll go away, well, they're lying. Our faith won't make them go away, but with our Savior by our side, those problems don't have to conquer us. The psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We 
can experience those blessings personally as we, through the gospel, grow in our faith. But as we support our church's efforts to try to reach out to our community, to reach out to the people in our church, and our synod's efforts to stand up for Jesus throughout the world, then vicariously what we can also do is experience gospel blessings because, well, you know what we're going to know is that there are souls who didn't know about Jesus who now can know about Jesus and his grace and love. And they can know the solution to the problem of sin and they can be rescued from the eternal punishment that they deserved and can be certain of eternal life in heaven. And we can know that those people who've heard the gospel and whose hearts the Holy Spirit has worked like that, that they're being blessed just as we are already because God has made us his believing children. The conclusion to this parable is especially appropriate for today. Remember, today is the second Sunday of end time, last judgment Sunday, one of the Sundays of the end of the church year. And the focus at the end of the church year is always on our, our Savior's second coming and the final judgment. Through this parable, we're reminded of what God expects of us. And he is serious about the work he wants us, his servants, to do. The nobleman said here simply, put this money to work until I come back. And what does our Savior say to us? He says, until I return on Judgment Day, faithfully use my word to grow in your faith and to reach out to others with the gospel message, to reach out to those who don't know about Jesus yet. That's what Jesus expects of us. And well, when you think about it, what responsibilities do we have in life that are more important than making sure we ourselves and then more and more people? And now when we talk about more and more people, we'd have to say first off, especially our family, those closest to us, our friends, and then also people throughout the world that they would hear the gospel, that they would know about the Savior who lived and died for them to pay for all of their sins, to give us his holiness, his righteousness, so that we could stand before God worthy of eternal life in heaven. Not because of our deeds, but because of Jesus, our Savior. May we always be looking for opportunities therefore to opportunities to be faithful to our lord to personally keep growing in our faith and well to stand up for jesus and to share god's precious gospel message with the people around us and and then also to do all we can to support mission efforts with our offerings with whatever we can so that more people would know of our Savior's grace and love. The parable then does also speak of God's gracious reward for those who take advantage of those opportunities to be faithful. The servants in the parable who faithfully used their minas, they were blessed with even more. And so it can also be for us. When we faithfully use the gospel, God will bless us. God will bless us. Those blessings, well, we always have to say they may or may not include earthly blessings, but more importantly, they definitely will include spiritual blessings from God. He'll strengthen our faith. He'll encourage us, he'll guide us, and he'll keep us on the way that leads to our eternal salvation. But 
But why does God do all this for us? It's because of his grace and mercy. It's not that we've earned or deserved it. It's because of his grace and mercy. Even as we serve our Lord, we still have to say, yeah, as Isaiah says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. But our gracious God, he still wants to bless us. So let's never push him away, but let's take advantage of as many opportunities to be faithful as we possibly can. Spiritually speaking, let's not be like that wise and frugal village blacksmith who said, I'm not going to do anything. I'll let everybody else do it. May God help each of us to personally take advantage of opportunities to be faithful to our Lord so that, so that you and I keep growing in our faith in Jesus our Savior, keep getting closer and closer to him because God through his word is drawing us closer and closer to him. And as we grow, let's keep on doing everything we can to share the message of God's grace and love with our personal witness, with our offerings, so that more and more souls can be blessed like we are right now, knowing the grace and love of God, knowing that we're heirs of eternal life in heaven. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast and true in living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. We pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, and a special prayer we should pray today is thinking about Tuesday and Election Day here in our country. And, oh, as we should look for those opportunities to be faithful, we should also look for opportunities to be good and faithful citizens in our country, be informed voters who prayerfully consider the choices in front of us and, and always keep asking, what is it that God wants us to do? And, and of course, 
When we think about what God wants us to do, we know what his moral law says about being pro-life. Well, let's pray. Lord God, please guide us in the election process that comes around again in a couple of days. Help us to know the issues and to vote knowing what you would have us vote for. Please make our country strong by having more people in positions of power and leadership who know your grace and love. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name, and we gather up all of the prayers we have today as we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's join in singing our prayer for our country. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. Thank you for joining me for worship today. A few announcements to share with you. Oh. Monday is Caleb Norder's birthday. Tuesday, Emily Fritz, uh, the Boyce's daughter, Bob and Sherry's daughter's birthday. Also, Kelly Christmas's birthday. Wednesday, Haley Hall. Thursday would be Martin Luther's birthday. Friday, Gwen Faulkner. And Saturday, Devin Nelson. Thursday night, we do have a church council meeting. Next Sunday is going to be a campus ministry Sunday here. We'll have actually a, a guest preacher here from our campus ministry committee. On the weekend, there will be campus ministry committee meetings being held at our campus ministry building up in, up in East Lansing. And between services, there will be a presentation on, on campus ministry by some people from our campus ministry committee. Hope you all can join us for the worship and for the presentation between. I would just also tell you that, oh, my dad's coming along, still struggling along, but he's doing okay. Um, still at the nursing home. Paula dealing with infection in her legs that doesn't seem to be going away. I think she said she's on another series of antibiotics on that. And please do also keep Stan Krosick in your prayers. Kind of still dealing with that shingles and 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 then also dealing with the with the passing of, of his daughter a couple weeks ago. Well keep all of them and all of the people in our prayer list in your prayers. Again, thank you for joining me for worship here today. The Lord bless and keep you always. Amen.